Hey friends, I'm sorry it's been a while since we have read from the Indian in the cupboard, but I'm ready if you are. We are on chapter six, the chief is dead, long live the chief. So here we go. He got to school early by running all the way. The first thing he did was to head for the school library shelves for a book on Indians. And to his joy, he soon found one under the section labeled Peoples of the World, a book called On the Trail of the Iroquois. He couldn't take it out because there was nobody there to write him down for it, but he sat down then and there on the bench and began to read it. Now, Omri was not what you'd call a great reader. He couldn't get into books somehow unless he knew them already and how, as his teacher never tired of asking, was he ever going to get to know any more books until he read them for the first time. And this On the Trail of the Iroquois was not exactly a comic. Tiny print, hardly any pictures, and no fewer than 300 pages. Getting into this was obviously out of the question. So Omri just dipped. He managed to find out one or two fairly interesting things straight away. Iroquois Indians were sometimes called the Five Nations. One of the five were the Mohawks, a tribe Omri had heard of. They had indeed lived in longhouses, not teepees, and their main foods had been maize and squash, whatever they were, and beans. Did anyone just make a connection? Maize, squash, and beans. Aren't those the three sisters? Hmm. And maize is that corn, in case you were wondering. These vegetables had for some strange reason been called the three sisters. Oh, too funny, Mrs. Heck caught it before she even read it. There were many mentions of the Algonquins as the Iroquois enemies, and Omri confirmed that the Iroquois had fought beside the English while the Algonquins fought for the French sometime in the 1700s, and that both sides had scalped like mad. At this point, he really began to get interested. The book, in its terribly grown-up way, was telling, trying to tell him something about why the Indians had done such a lot of scalping. Omri had always thought it was just an Indian custom, but the book seemed to say that it wasn't at all, at least not till the white man came. The white man, that's us by the way, seemed to have made the Iroquois and the Algonquin keen on scalping each other, not to mention white man, French or English as the case might be, by offering them money and whiskey and guns. Omri was deep in the book, frowning heavily several minutes after the bell had rung. Someone had to tap him on the shoulder and tell him to hurry into the assembly. Too funny what happens when you get interested in reading. The morning lasted forever. Three times his teacher had, ca had caused to tell Omri to wake up. At last, Patrick leaned over and whispered, you're even dreamier than usual today. What's up? I'm thinking about your Indian. Listen hissed Patrick. I think you're putting me on about that Indian. It was nothing so marvelous. You can buy them for a few pence in Yaps. Yaps was their local news agent and toy shop. I know, and all the equipment for them. I'm going shopping at lunch break. Are you coming? <gasps> We're not allowed to leave the school at lunch unless we eat at home, and you know that. I'm going anyway. I've got to. Go after school. No, I've got to go home after school. What? Are you say, staying to skateboard? Omri and Patrick, will you kindly stop chattering? They stopped. At long last, lunchtime came. I'm going. Are you coming? No, there'll only be trouble. Well, I can't help that. You're a twit. Twit or not, Omri sneaked out, ran across the playground, through the hole in the fence. The front gate was kept locked to keep the inference from going into the road. And in five minutes, by running all the way, he had reached Yaps. The selection of plastic figures there was good. There was one whole box of mixed cowboys and Indians. Omri searched till he found a chief wearing a cloak and a full leather headdress with a bow in his hand and a quiver full of arrows slung across his back. 
Omri bought it with part of his lunch money and rushed back to school before he could be missed. He showed the chief to Patrick. Why get another Indian? Only for the bow and arrows. Patrick was now looking at him as if he had gone completely screwy. In the afternoon, mercifully, they had two periods of handicrafts. Omri had completely forgotten to bring the teepee he'd made, but there were plenty of scraps of felt, sticks, needles, and thread lying about the handicraft room, and he soon made one, another one, much better than the first. Sewing had always bored him rigid, but now he sat for half an hour stitching away without even looking up. He was trying to achieve the patched look of a real teepee made of odd-shaped pieces of hide, and he also found a way of bracing the sticks so that they didn't fold up every time they were nudged. Very good, Omri, remarked his teacher several times. Oh, what patience all of a sudden. Omri, who usually liked praise as much as anyone, hardly heard her. He was concentrating so hard. After a long time, he became aware that Patrick was standing over him, breathing through his nose rather noisily to attract his attention. Is that for my Indian? My Indian, and yes. Why are you doing it in bits like that? To be like a real one? Real ones have designs on them. So will this. He's going to paint proper Iroquois, Iroquois ones. Who is? Little Bear. That's his name. Why not call him Runny Nose? Asked Patrick with a grin. Omri looked up at him blankly. Because his name is Little Bear, he said, and Patrick stopped grinning. He frowned. I wish you'd stop this stupid business, he said peevishly, going on as if it weren't a joke. Omri went on looking at him for a moment and then went back to his bracing. Each pair of sticks had to have another short stick glued between them. It was quite tricky. Patrick stood a moment and then said, can I come home with you today? No, I'm sorry, said Omri. Why not? Mum's having guests, Omri mumbled. He didn't tell lies very well, and Patrick knew at once it was a lie, and he was hurt. Oh, all right then, be like that, he said, and he stopped off furiously. The afternoon ended at last, and Omri accomplished the walk home, with, which with normal dawdling took about a half an hour. It took him over a little, little over ten minutes. He arrived sorely out of breath and greeted his surprised mother. Have you developed a jet engine or have you been expelled from school? With a lot of gasping and a request to go straight to his room without waiting for tea. What have you been up to up there? There's an awful mess on the floor. Looks like bits of grass and bark. And where did you get that beautiful little Indian teepee? I think it's made of real leather. Omri looked at her speechless. I, he began at last, telling lies to Patrick was one thing. Lying to his mother, that was quite something else. He never did it unless the emergency was dire, but mercifully the phone rang just then, so he was spared for the moment. He dashed upstairs. There was indeed a fair old mess, though no worse than he often left himself when he had been working on something. Little Bear and the horse were nowhere to be seen, but Omri guessed where to look behind the dress-up crate. A wonderful sight met his eyes, a longhouse, not finished, but no less interesting and beautiful for that stood on the seed box, whose smooth surface was now much trampled over. There were hoof, as well as moccasin prints. Omri saw that a ramp made of part of the bark had been laid against the side of the wooden box, up which the horse had been led, to Omri's delight, odd as it may seem, a tiny pile of horse manure lay on the ramp as proof of the horse passing. And there he was tied by a thread to an upright twig hammered, presumably, into the ground, munching a small pile of grass that the Indian had carried up for him. Little Bear himself was still working so intently that he didn't even notice that he was not alone. Omri watched him in utter fascination. The longhouse was about half finished. The twigs, which had been taken from the birch tree on the lawn, had been stripped of their bark, leaving them shiny white. Each one had then been bent into an arch, the ends thrust into the earth, and cross pieces lashed to the sides with thread. More and more twigs, which were stout poles to the Indian, had been added, with 
never a nail or a screw needed to strengthen that structure. And now Little Bear had begun to fix flakes of bark like tiny tiles onto the cross pieces. He was seated on the roof itself, his feet locked around the main roof pole, which ran the length of the house, hanging these bark tiles, each of which he had he would first carefully shape with his knife. The knight's battle axe lay on the ground beside an unused pile of twigs. It had clearly been used to chop and strip them and had been made to serve Little Bear's purpose very well. At last, Omri saw him straighten up, stretch his arms towards the ceiling, and open his mouth in a tremendous noisy yawn. Tired? he asked him. Little Bear got such a fright he almost fell off the longhouse roof, and the horse neighed and tugged at his rope. But then Little Bear looked up and saw Omri hanging over the crate far above him and grinned. Here's a picture. Little Bear tired, work many hour. Look, make longhouse, work for many braves. I make alone, also not good tools. Axe Omri give heavy, why no tomahawk? Omri was getting used to this Indian's ungrateful ways and was not offended. He showed him, to the te showed him the teepee he had made. I suppose you won't want this now you've got your longhouse, he said rather sadly. Want? Want? He seemed to decide teepees had their uses after all. He circled, good, give paints, make pictures. Omri unearthed his poster paints. When he came back with them, he found Little Bear sitting cross-legged on the earth facing the figure of the chief that Omri had put next to the teepee. Little Bear was clearly puzzled. It's plastic said Omri. I bought it in the shop. Plastic? Little Bear stared at the figure with its big feather headdress. You make magic get bow and arrows from plastic. Yes. Also, make feathers real, he asked with a gleam in his eye. You like the headdress? Little Bear like, but that for chief. Little Bear not chief till father die. But you could just try it on. Little Bear looked doubtful, but he nodded. Make real, then see. Omri shut the Indian chief into the cupboard. Before he turned the key, he leaned down to where Little Bear was examining the, to him, enormous pots of paint. Little Bear, are you lonely? Huh? Would you like a, a friend? Got friend, said Indian, jerking his head toward the horse. I meant another Indian. Little Bear looked up swiftly, his hands still. There was long silence. Wife? He asked at last. No, it's a man, said Omri. The, the chief. Not want, said Little Bear immediately, and went back to his work with bent head. Omri was disappointed. He had thought it might be fun to have two Indians, but somehow he couldn't do anything Little Bear didn't want. He would have to treat his chief as he had treated the knight, grab the weapons, and turn him back into plastic again at once. Only this time it was not quite so easy. When he opened the cupboard, the chief was still sitting on the shelf, looking about him in bewilderment, blinking as the light struck his eyes. Omri saw at once that he was a very old man, and he was covered in wrinkles. He took the bow out of his hands quite easily, but the quiver full of arrows was hung around him on a leather thong. And as for actually lifting the feathered headdress clean off his gray old hair head, Omri found he just could not bring himself to do it. It seemed so rude. The old man gazed up at him blankly at first and then with dawning terror, but he didn't get up and he didn't speak, though Omri saw his lips moving and noticed he had hardly any teeth. Omri somehow felt he should offer the old chief some friendly word to reassure him, so he held up one hand, as white men sometimes did in films when they were treating Indian chiefs with politeness, and he said, how? The old man lifted a trembling hand and then suddenly he slumped onto his side. Little bear, little bear, quick! Get onto my hand! Omri reached down and Little Bear climbed onto his hand from the longhouse roof. What? The old Indian, I, th I think he's fainted! He carried Little Bear to the cupboard and Little Bear stepped off onto the shelf. He stood beside the crumpled figure, taking the single feather out of the back of his own headband. He held it up in front of the old man's mouth. Then he shook his head. Dead, he said. No breath. Heart stop. Old man. Gone to ancestors. Very happy. Without more ado, he began to strip the body, taking the headdress, the arrows, and the big, richly decorated cloak for good measure. Omri was shocked. Little Bear, stop. Surely you shouldn't. 
Chief dead. I only other Indian here. No one else to be chief. Little bear chief now, he said, whirling the cloak about his own bare shoulders and clapping the splendid circle of feathers onto his head with a flourish. He picked up the quiver. Omri, give bow, he commanded, and it was a command Omri obeyed without even thinking. Now, you make magic. Deer for little bear to hunt. Fire for cook. Good meat. He folded his arms, scowling up at Omri. Omri was quite taken aback by all this. While giving Little Bear every respect as a person, he was not about to be turned into his little slave. He began to wonder if giving him those weapons, let alone letting him make himself into a chief, was such a good idea. Now look here, Little Bear, he began in a teacherish tone. Omri! It was his father's voice, fairly roaring at him from the front of the stairs. Omri jumped, bumping the cupboard. Little Bear fell over backward, considerably spoiling his dignity. Yes? Come down here this instant. Omri had no time for courtesies. He snatched Little Bear up, set him down near his half-finished longhouse, shut and locked the cupboard, and ran downstairs. His father was waiting for him. Omri, have you been in the greenhouse lately? Uh, and did you, while you were there, remove a seed tray planted out with the Maro seeds, I may, I ask? Well, I... Yes or no? Well, yes, but... And is it possible that in addition, you have been hacking at the trunk of a birch and torn off strips of bark? But dad, it was only... Don't you know trees can die if you strip too much of their bark off? It's like their skin. And as for that seed tray, that is mine. You've no business taking things from the greenhouse and you know it. Now I want it back and you'd better not have disturbed the seeds or heaven help you. Omri swallowed hard. He and his father stared at each other. I can't give it back, he said but I'll buy you another tray and some more seeds. I've got enough money, please. Omri's father had a quick temper, especially about anything concerning the garden, but he was not unreasonable. And above all, he was not the sort to pry into his children's secrets. He realized at once that his seed tray as a seed tray was lost to him forever and that it was no use hectoring Omri about it. All right, he said, you can go to the hardware shop and buy them, but I want them today. Omri's face fell. Today, but it's nearly five o'clock now. Precisely, now be off. Chapter seven is called Uninvited Brothers. And considering that Omri is the only one with brothers, I'm guessing it's gonna be them. Let's hope they don't find Omri or the horse. All right, till next chapter. Talk to you soon.